It's really loud when there isn't music. <laughs> I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters you all are. Have windy words and no limit. Oh, what provokes you that keeps you on, keeps you talking? Welcome to worship. Have you ever gotten into a conversation with friends and everything they said in response to you felt wrong? Like they didn't hear what you were actually saying. Today, Job and his friends begin to talk. They begin to talk about the suffering of Job and God's role in it. I invite you to close your eyes and settle in. Let us pray. God, be with us today, here in this place where we learn about friends who speak past each other, who see the world differently and believe everyone should see it their way. Help us to recognize ourselves in Job's story and to recognize you in our story. Amen. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, Why is light given to one in misery and life to the bitter in soul, who longs for death but it does not come, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave? Why is light given to one who cannot see the way whom God has fenced in? For my sighing comes like my bread and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. If one ventures a word with you, will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? Think now, who that was innocent ever perished, or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow inequity and sow trouble reap the same. Now a word came stealing to me. My ear received the whisper of it. Amid the thoughts from visions of the night, when deep sleep falls on mortals, a form was before my eyes. There was a silence. Then I heard a voice. Can mortals be righteous before God? Can human beings be pure before their maker? Oh, that my vexation were weighed and all my calamity laid in the balances. For then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash. Oh, that I might have my request, and that God would grant my desire, that it would please God to crush me, that he would let loose his hand and cut me off. This would be my consolation. I would even exult in unrelenting pain, for I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Teach me, and I will be silent. Make me understand how I have gone wrong. How forceful are honest words. But your reproof, what does it reprove? Do you think that you can reprove words as if speech of the desperate were win? You would even cast lots over the orphan and bargain over your friend. How long will you say these things and the words of your mouth be a great wind? Does God pervert justice or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children sinned against him, he delivered them into the power of their transgression. See, God will not reject a blameless person nor take the hand of evildoers. Can a human being be just before God? Remember that you fashioned me like clay, and will you turn me to dust again? Should a multitude of words go unanswered, and should one full of talk be vindicated? 
Should your babble put others to silence? And when you mock, shall no one shame you? For you say, My conduct is pure, and I am clean in God's sight. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips to you, and that he would tell you the secrets of wisdom, for wisdom is many-sided. Know then that God exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and come to their end without hope. For there is hope for a tree if it is cut down that it will sprout again and that its shoots will not cease. Where then is my hope? Who will see my hope? For I know that my Redeemer lives and that at last he will stand upon the earth after my skin has been thus destroyed. Then in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and my eyes shall behold and not another. We are 14, 15. We moved from the middle of Illinois from a small town to the top of Illinois in a small town. And the day I found out I was leaving, I told my friend Dwayne that I was going and that I was happy to be getting out of there. And he said to me, he wished he could leave that he I don't know, remember his exact words, but I got the feeling that he was thinking about suicide, that death was an option. But here's the thing, back in 1980, I didn't know what you did with that information. I didn't know what somebody said to you, because we didn't have suicide awareness days. We didn't have days, we didn't have people tell us how to respond to someone who speaks that way. And so over the years, every once in a while, I think about him and think about, did I do wrong? Is he still alive? Did he make it out of there? Is he okay? Job says in this section, so last week we learned that Job's entire life came crashing down, that all of his property and his farm was destroyed. And we learned that his family was, all of his children were killed, and that he was struck with an illness that left him as one of the outcasts in society. And so his first words that he speaks after he has sat on the ground in silence for seven days with three of his friends are, Oh, sorry. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, Why is life given in one in misery and life to the bitter in soul? In that first chapter, when Job speaks, he talks about how he wished he had never been born. How he wished that his life was not the way it was right now. He laments the day of his birth and being brought into this world. As a pastor, you get those calls. Since I started my ministry, 
in my very first student church job. I was sent to the hospital since I was down in Chicago, and they said, well, you're right near the University of Chicago. You go visit them. And when I walked in the room, what the woman wanted to talk about is how she didn't want to be alive anymore, that she was a burden to her family. And I want to tell you, I was in my 30s. She was in her 40s. And she had been diagnosed with, um, I think it was ultra colitis, whatever, where you have to take everything out eventually as it progresses as a disease. And she didn't want to be a burden to her husband and her two daughters. And I don't know that I was very good at how I responded then because it was my first outing with somebody telling me something so, so hard to hear that I didn't know what to do. But I knew enough at that point that you call in help. That you make sure you talk to them, let they express everything they need to you, and then you find them the person that can help them. So I made sure after I left her room to say to the nurses at the nurses station, have you sent in a social worker to talk to her? Have you, have you talked to her about how she's feeling? Because there's a lot going on there that, that needs help beyond my skill. And then I followed up with my pastor, the person who I'm reporting to, saying, have you talked to them? <laughs> because you really need to speak to them. Because it's beyond my help. And then in my first church, somebody calls me in the middle of the night, and I keep them on the phone asking them the questions you're supposed to ask. Because by this time, I'm like, well, i got to research what to do if this happens to me again. So you're supposed to ask them if they have a plan, if they have a timeline, if they have the instrument to perform their plan. And then you're supposed to keep them talking until you can get them to agree to come see you. Or to come, you know, make a promise and a plan to be present for you. And then once you can get off the phone, you're supposed to call in back up and help. And that has happened to me every place. Except here, I haven't had one here yet. How do you respond to somebody in so much pain? So, Job's friends don't respond very well. Because the first words that they respond back to him, if one ventures a word with you, Will you listen? Will you be offended? But who can keep from speaking? And so then, this dialogue happens between Job and his friends where they start speaking past each other. Where his friends start saying to him, you know, bad things only happen to bad people. That God only punishes the unrighteous. That everything bad that has happened to you happened because you did something wrong. You sinned against God and God caused your punishment. So, Job's friends are presenting us with the idea that is common. It was common then and it is common now that that you get blessed because God is on your side. I mean, it's all the prosperity gospel, right? If you watch Joel Olstein, that if you pray enough and God is on your side, you're going to be blessed with family and wealth. But there's something wrong with you if you don't get that, right? That there's something that you did that caused you not to be wealthy and happy and have your life fulfilled. Sometimes we say of those who are poor that they're just lazy. Of those who are suffering, well, they just didn't eat right. They didn't take care of themselves. They didn't do the right things. 
And we say of the wealthy that they are hardworking, that they did everything they could to make this happen. And so Job's friends have that idea that the way the world works is that those who are poor and those who are sick have done something wrong and they've gotten what they deserve. And those who are wealthy and healthy are blessed by God and have gotten what they deserve. And Job, who's on the other side of that, because we know the backstory that there was this disagreement in heaven and God said, okay, let's test his faith. And we'll test his faith by taking everything away from him. So Job knows internally, I have never done anything wrong. I have only ever spoken well of God. I still believe in God. I don't know why you are arguing with me. I have never done anything wrong. You know this of me, right? And then a friend will come back at him. Come on. You're sitting in an ash heap. You have nothing left in your life. You sinned against God. Just admit it. Just repent and things will change for you. And Job is like, you know me. I didn't do anything wrong. And then as this discussion keeps going on, he starts changing his argument. He starts saying that it just isn't about how he didn't do anything wrong. But he wants God to come and prove it to them. He wants God to come and tell them that he didn't do anything wrong. He wants God to show up in that place. And so he starts crying out for an advocate, a savior, a redeemer to come and rescue him from this nightmare that he has landed himself in. He starts calling for the redeemer to come for him. That's where that famous line that we sing a lot in different hymns comes from. I know that my redeemer lives. It's Job crying out in pain for someone to come and say, this really isn't my fault. This really isn't my fault. Because in this discussion that Job is having, they're talking about what causes suffering. What causes pain to happen? Where does it come from and what is God's role in it? And how do we talk about God's place in suffering and in pain and in poverty and in weakness? Where is God's place? Now, they aren't coming where we're coming from because we come from Jesus and Jesus says, I'm going to be there with you in your weakness. I am there with you in all those places of pain and hurt. They're coming from it in a place where this is a question. Where is God in suffering? Because as you read through the Bible, you will find it all throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, that there's this theory that if you're blessed, you'll get wealth and happiness and money. And if you're sinful, all that will be taken away from you. So you see that in the Old Testament when tribes come through and wipe out the Israelites and take them off into bondage. And the explanation is often, God caused this to happen. God caused it because you were a sinful people and have forgotten God. And Job, the book of Job, wants to argue against that theology wants to say that isn't really what God's about, that it, God is more mysterious and less determinative than that. God isn't vindictive that way. And so the book of Job is to see what that argument looks like when they talk to each other. But the thing we see in the book of Job is that they talk past each other, that neither side is hearing each other. Like for those seven days when they sat in silence, they heard each other and felt each other and were with each other. And now that they've opened their mouths, those friends 
are doing one of the right steps for the person who is thinking about suicide. Keep them talking. Listen to what they're saying. The problem is when they open their mouths to speak back, they are telling him that he really is wrong and sinful. That he really is to blame for everything that happened to him. And so they aren't truly hearing each other. They aren't hearing that Job is lamenting that this can't be who God is. And so they aren't having that discussion about, well, what is the mystery of God? How do we talk about God in a way that allows for pain and misery, but doesn't believe that God caused it? They don't have that discussion. They have, I'm in my camp that God is the cause of this. And Job, we don't know where you went wrong, but you have seriously gone off the rails. It reminds me a lot of our world right now, right? That our two sides of this country can't seem to sit together and talk. They can't seem to be in the same place and hear each other. That we can't hear what the other side is saying. In fact, anymore, if we don't like what the other side is saying, we've exited the building and no longer even talk to each other. So one of the things we can learn from Job is you stay in the conversation even if you disagree with each other completely. That you keep trying to speak to each other. Maybe unlike Job, you might want to change the subject and move on to the Cubs, you know? But you keep in dialogue with each other. And it may come up again, and you may list all your points out again. Luckily for Job, we'll get to the point where God comes in and rescues the story. But until then, what we learned this week is that it's okay to disagree with each other about what we believe, about what we think. But we need to stay in the conversation. And according to the book of Job, we move, need to move towards an understanding of God that is bigger than anything we've thought of before. That God is beyond any box, any understanding, any story that says this is who God is. That we need to think about that side of the story. That when somebody tells you for sure this is it, this is how it is, God often at that point says, I've got something else to teach you. And Job wants to remind us of that. That God is beyond those simple explanations that say you get what you deserve. Karma's going to bite you. God is more mysterious. And that when you are in that place of suffering and pain, it's okay to cry out. To cry out, where is my hope? Will anyone see my hope? Will my Redeemer come? Amen. I invite you to settle into prayer. I invite you to close your eyes, to breathe in deeply, to hear the wonderful sounds of babies that all of us have missed, to breathe in deeply, to breathe in love, and to breathe out peace.
With God, our wisdom and strength, God has counsel and understanding. God gives us wisdom. Wisdom to move past the noise and discern the truth. Wisdom to know what is good and true and right. Wisdom to make good decisions. God, give me strength, strength to handle the pain and grief in the world right now. Strength to lift up those in need. Strength to comfort those who are grieving. Strength to help the lost find a path. Strength to share another's burden. Strength to hear a cry for help when someone expresses a wish to die. Strength to stay with the person contemplating suicide and get them help. God, counsel me. Words matter. What we read and write and say matter. Our words can be like stones that hold someone down. Our very speech can hurt others and lead to violence and destruction. Share your understanding that we may learn to love as you love, that we may forgive as you forgive, that we may hope when all seems hopeless as we pray together the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. God of the cosmos and God of every heartbeat, your work touches every corner of creation. Yet when times are hard, we wonder if you've deserted us and we become tight-fisted and fearful that sharing with others will leave us empty-handed. As we bring these gifts, give us the eye to see and the heart to know that you never desert us and never send us away in need. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. 